Hello everyone, in this video we are going to talk about uh, ventricular septal defect, the hemodynamics involved in ventricular septal defect and some of the findings because of these hemodynamic changes. The ventricular septal defect is one of the most commonest congenital heart disease in the world and based on where the ventricular septal defect is present, the ventricular septal defect can be classified as a membranous ventricular septal defect and the muscular uh, muscular ventricular septal defect. The muscular, uh, muscular ventricular septal defect is uh, has a very high chance of closing spontaneously, whereas the membranous takes uh, needs a surgical repair. So to understand the hemodynamics involved in a ventricular septal defect, here I've drawn a schematic diagram of the heart. This is the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. This is the interventricular septum. And this is the ventricular septal defect. Here we'll get the iota, this being the pulmonary artery, and we'll draw the lungs here. So, to understand the clinical findings involved in a ventricular septal defect, it's very important to understand the hemodynamics. So, we'll start with the blood flow occurring in the uh, left ventricular septum. Initially, because there's a ventricular septum, part of the blood in the left ventricle, uh, left ventricle has two options. Either it can go into the iota or it can pass through the ventricular septum defect. When the left ventricle is contracting during the systole, part of the blood enters into the right ventricle and part of it goes into the iota. But you should remember that the pressure existing here is lesser and therefore most of it, most or majority of the blood crosses the septal defect and enters into the right ventricle. At the same time, you should remember the LV and the RV is simultaneously going to systole. So when LV is contracting, RV is also contracting at the same time. That means all of the blood which is entering into the right ventricle through the defect, most of it will directly enter into the pulmonary artery. So, the pulmonary artery is receiving blood both from the RV and the LV. That means there is increased pulmonary blood flow during the cardiac systole. As the blood passes through the pulmonary artery, it then reaches the lungs. You should remember that because more amount of blood is entering into the pulmonary artery, that means the lungs are also receiving increased pulmonary blood flow. They are oxygenating all of this increased pulmonary blood flow and all of this ends entering into the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. So the uh, funda here is that even though most of the blood is entering the RV, you are not concerned about the volume overload in the RV. It is the volume overload in the left side of the heart that we should be uh, concerned about because uh, during systole, more all of the blood is coming out through the pulmonary artery and then the volume overload occurs in the left atrium and when more amount of blood enters into the left atrium that whole of that blood has to enter into the left ventricle so volume overload occurs in both left atrium and left ventricle and not the uh, right ventricle now that we know what happens in a ventricular septal defect, let's try to understand some of the clinical findings which occur. Now, uh, the ventricular septal defect is present here. You should, uh, it's just sense, it makes sense that as long as LV is contracting, blood is flowing across this ventricular septal defect. That means the murmur that is found due to turbulence of the blood flow here, this murmur will continue to be present as long as the LV is contracting, which means it will be present throughout the systole. Therefore, this murmur is a holosystolic murmur, that is a pansystolic murmur. As long as the ventricle is contracting, this murmur will be present. That's why it's a pansystolic murmur. Next, when the blood flows out of this ventricular septal defect into right ventricle, at the same time the RV is contracting, so increase pulmonary blood flow. Increased blood flow through a normally existing wall means there should be a turbulent flow. That means there should be a murmur. And this murmur will be seen as an ejection systolic murmur. But this murmur in the pulmonic area 
will not be heard because this holosystolic murmur is quite loud and this will mask the presence of this ejection systolic murmur. Next, because there is an increased pulmonary blood flow to the lungs, this when you do a chest x-ray, you will find the prominent pulmonary vasculature because of increased pulmonary blood flow and this finding is called as a plethoric pulmonary field. This basically indicates there is increasing pulmonary blood flow. Now, when there is a volume overload, the LA is accommodating all of that and that large volume of blood is being passed through this small mitral valve. So, again, large volume of blood passing through a smaller valve, obviously there should be a turbulence. And this should cause something called as the end diastolic murmur. But again, this murmur is not made out because this holosystolic murmur is quite loud. So, these are uh, the auscultatory findings. One more thing that happens here is, when the LV is contracting, part of it goes into the right ventricle through the VST, part of it enters the iota. That means, there is less blood entering into the iota. That again means that the iota here, it will close way before, aortic valve. The aortic valve closes earlier than the pulmonary valve here because the pulmonary valve is sending more blood into the pulmonary artery. Therefore, the aortic valve closes earlier when compared to the pulmonary valve. This in turn means that the A2 that is the component of the second heart sound due to the closure of aortic valve precedes the P2. This in turn finally impl uh, implies that there is a S2 split. A2 precedes P2 and this S2 split is a wide split. Because there is lot of difference between the time where the aortic wall closes and where the, when the pulmonary wall closes. So this is seen as a wide S2 split and because the uh, pressure variation is seen during inspiration and expiration, this split is nothing uh, it's a variable split these are the findings which we see on a during auscultation now let's see some of the palpatory findings again we'll draw a schematic diagram of the heart now as seen in the uh, as seen previously there is increased blood flow to the left atrium That means, over a course of time, this left atrium will enlarge. It will enlarge so as to accommodate this volume overload. And there is also increased blood flow in the left ventricle. And so therefore, this also will enlarge. Because You should remember that a volume overload condition will cause lead to hypertrophy and dilatation at the same time, whereas a pressure overload will lead to hypertrophy and not dilatation. And because this is a uh, volume overload condition you will see a dilatation now because there is left ventricular dilatation there is a, a very obvious finding which will be seen here the apex beat which you will palpate will be shifted because there is a dilatation and where will be the shift it will be lateral and downwards this happens over a course of time and it will not be seen in the initial stages and this apex beat which is present it will be a hyperdynamic beat because it's a volume overload condition. Hyperdynamic beat, apex beat is mainly a beat which is uh, felt in two intercostal spaces and it's lateral and outward and it, a thrust is felt which lifts your finger, sustains and then falls. So this is one of the palpatory finding. Next, LA enlargement, this can be also uh, seen but this is more seen on, a, it can be seen on a chest x-ray rather than a palpatory finding. Over a course of time, as the VST uh, is present for a long time, because there is increased pulmonary blood flow, the lungs to make up for the increased pulmonary blood flow, it will start undergoing either an obstructive pulmonary artery hypertension or an hyperkinetic uh, pulmonary artery hypertension. Once the pulmonary hypertension sets in, to compensate for that, there will be a hypertrophy of the right ventricle seen. This hypertrophy of a right ventricle will cause 
enlargement over a course of time this is uh, after a very long time and this rv enlargement can be seen as a parasternal heave and because of rv uh, rv enlargement you may also feel an epigastric pulsation should note that these findings occur very late only after development of pulmonary artery hypertension whenever there is pulmonary artery hypertension one thing you will notice is a loud p2 when you auscultate especially in the uh, pulmonary area and you will also notice a palpable p2 on palpation as only in the pulmonary area so these are some of the uh, findings which we'll see in a ventricular septal defect because of the hemodynamic changes uh, you should also note that once the pulmonary artery hypertension sets in the rv pressures will exceed that of the lv pressures and this may lead to what is called as a right to left shunt whenever this right to left shunt occurs after development of a pulmonary artery hypertension it is called as eisenmenger syndrome and once this occurs because eisenmenger syndrome converts a left to right shunt into a right to left shunt and hence this baby which was a cyanotic before will finally turn cyanotic and once this is done it's very difficult to reverse the hemodynamic changes so surgical repair of a ventricular septal defect is important to prevent the occurrence of eisenmenger syndrome that's it in this video thanks for watching